So it wasn't really like until middle school that I felt like that I wanted to teach. Um, I was transferred schools my fourth grade year, and I was like really nervous. Who wouldn't be? Um, the new building was a lot larger than the one that I'd come from. There were like a million hallways. Um, my homeroom teacher was really difficult to get along with, and I was grateful for the opportunity that I was given because I was allowed to go out of that classroom and into like an enrichment classroom for math and English. Um, and the teacher's name was Mrs. Hip, which was a cool name because she was hip. Um, and I didn't really like, have a hard time talking with her about concerns. I like struggled for a while there in math because I think it was like multiplication facts and I had a really hard time with it for some reason. But when it came around to it, I trusted her in my academics, but I also trusted her with a social experience. Um, <clears throat> when one student sexually harassed me, I spoke with her and she helped me find a solution. Um, I knew that I was supported and loved by her because she supported me through that. Um, I still see her now and I contact her and she's the greatest person ever. Um, I've written many essays on her impact in my life because she's the one that you don't really forget. So, um, Also throughout my junior high and high school career when I moved up from elementary, I was continually supported by school officials. Um, another sexual harassment incident happened with a group of boys in my seventh grade class. And when I reached out to my vice principal, she helped me find a solution. Um, boys in my school seemed relentless, but I too was relentless. The teachers and administrators I had not only supported me with enrichment and academic support, but they also provided an emotional support. Um, their care is one that I wish to provide to all my future students, and I want each child to know that they are worthy, capable, and the idea of being a teacher and like I grew up playing school with my neighborhood friends and like I really got into the role I would um, like spend my spending money on school supplies and um, I would like go on the computer and look up worksheets for like my friends to do and um, I would oh my gosh I can't I'm like losing my mind. You know, it's I'm gonna okay. like read this. You know what? You're you're really okay. It's okay. gonna be okay. I it can it's allowed to be rehearsed because it's written down. So yeah. I understand. Okay, I'm gonna go again go and it. I'm gonna like read <clears throat> because I'm like okay. You've got. Okay, so ever since I was a young girl, I always loved the idea of being a teacher. I grew up playing with my playing school with my neighborhood friends and I always insisted on being the teacher. And even while playing at school, like I really got into the role of the teacher. I would um, spend my spending money on school supplies for my pretend class in the basement. And I would um, like go on my computer and print out worksheets and waste all my parents' ink. So they love me for that. No, but <laughs> um, and while playing school with my friends, like I was, I always taught as if they were like in younger grades. So it was never like middle school or high school. It was always like second grade or third grade because I like to grade their stuff and like easy stuff but um I think this had to do a lot with like my mom because she nannied she was always like nannying younger kids and um that's just where like my love for children came from and my mother like taught me a lot about comforting loving and taking care of children like how to change diapers how to like feed the newborn babies and um because of this she's like the reason I wanted to become a teacher I valued how much time she spent helping these kids learn in the early years before they went to preschool or kindergarten. And um, she had like a lot of influence on their like early education. And although like my mother was the first person to influence my decision as a teacher, like to become a teacher, there have been like two other women in my life where um, they've taught me a lot about teaching and who I want to be when I grow up. So in second grade, I went through like a really hard situation where I had to get brain surgery. And during this time, like I was really nervous and scared because like, I don't know, they're going to have surgery on my brain or whatever. <laughs> but um, my second grade teacher was always so comforting before and after the surgery. She always like was there to listen to me when I was really scared at school and like answer questions to the best of, she best of her ability about the surgery. And like even after my surgery, she came to visit me and she gave me a gift basket with cards from my like classmates that um, they had made for me and even in the hospital like the whole class would call me on the phone so it was on the speaker Aww. but it was really sweet and she was just very understanding and supportive through the whole situation and like she's the kind of teacher that I want to be like always there even like in situations outside of school not just like in school and so um like I will provide support and love and comfort to my future students just like she did to me 
And lastly, the last person who um, influenced my decision as a teacher was my sister-in-law. She um, actually, like, she's like the most recent person recently, like a couple years ago. I was like, wow, she's like an awesome teacher. But she's a second grade teacher and whenever I needed help with school or like with projects about education, she would let me come in and observe her students or like do little tests on them. And like she always like, her door was always open. Like she was like, yeah, come in whenever. I'd love for you to like just come in and help or just like observe whatever you want. So she's like a perfect example of like a flexible teacher, which is something I admire because it's really hard to like be flexible, especially like she's like a newer teacher. So it's just like awesome how much flexibility she like has. And like while observing her class, I saw how she like demonstrated a knowledge of the material while she still was taking on the role of like a warm, gentle, motherly figure. So these people have taught me a lot about teaching and how and how have they influenced me to share the same kind of characteristics they do with my future classroom someday. So. Well, while my personal story of why I wanted to be a teacher was one of emotion and more like social issues, this doesn't mean that I don't understand that I'm there to teach children how to take ownership of their education. Um, so I want, I want to be a social support, but I also want my students to leave the classroom feeling capable to move on in their lives and add knowledge to, you know, their futures. Um, as Edward states in her article about the role of a teacher, which is like one of my favorite articles that we did, um, I not only want to provide nurturance and guidance to my students, but I want to plan a curriculum that promotes my students' development in all domains, so like in all areas of their lives. Um, I want my students to be well equipped to engage in all areas of their life and while it's okay to have these big goals of like them achieving great things, um, I kind of wanted to establish a tool to help me achieve the goals that I've set um, and to determine what areas my students need growth in or like what areas in their life they need more knowledge in, I have to be observant. Um, something I've taken from this semester is the power of documenting, um, Reggio that we've talked about a lot. Um, heavily supports documentation as a means of teacher research and this research can not only support going like ongoing like researches or theses about um, general school observations but it should be specifically for my students so not just the school as a whole or education as a whole but like specifically in my classroom. Um, I want to be able to make my own conclusions about my students in school rather than just taking research and strategies at face value um, so just being that analytical person that's always looking for new reasons. Um, I also don't want to provide my students with what I think they need, but be a companion in their learning process. So although I can make as many observations as I want to, I should be willing to discuss with them what they think they need. Um, and Edwards also states the child <clears throat> and what their needs are determine who I become as the teacher. So this might be a challenge because I'll have like 20 children in my classroom or more. Um, and while I want to treat everyone with like equity and equality, I may have to be an ever-changing chameleon dependent upon the needs of my students. So I can't be the same teacher for one student all the time as I am for another student. Um, actively listening to my students can help equip me with what they need. Um, I should be observing and asking my students what they prefer. And this not only allows me to find new lesson plan ideas and engage my students, but it also creates a relationship that lets them know I listen to them. Um, this goes along with Edward's idea to follow the children's interests. Um, as a perfectionist, it might be hard for me to like let go of the structure of the lesson plan that I have. Like if I plan something and they're like, let's go look at this thing, it'll be hard for me to kind of release that. Um, just because I might not be knowledgeable in that area, um, I think it's important that I learn how to admit that I don't know the answers to everything. Um, and failure is one of the scariest things as a teacher, but it's also something that I look forward to. And I'm really learning that my humility goes a long way for my students. So during this course, I've learned a lot of new concepts that have impacted my role as a future teacher. And one thing that I previously knew before taking this course was the fact that play is important to um, a child's development and growth. But this course has really deepened my knowledge about this topic. And so um, Vygotsky talks a lot about play and how, many, how the many benefits it provides for children who immerse themselves in it. Just through like imaginative play, children develop a deeper vo vocabulary, <laughs> strong memory, and capability to reason. So children can learn a lot more through play than they would in like a classroom setting. So in the article, Scaffolding Children's Learning, Vygotsky in the Early Childhood Classroom, 
Vygotsky saw the language as the most significant milestone in child's cognitive development. So I've learned that this is important for child, for the child to have time to interact and play with one another just because like it furthers their development and like education and um, not a lot of this can be done with just like lecturing to the child. So um, it's important for them to play. I also found it fascinating that just as the ages of two and three, children become very skilled with having conversations with one another just because they interact and play. And through memory and reasoning, children have a better chance to remember and memorize the things put in front of them if they have had the chance to touch them and play with these toys instead of just like trying to memorize them. So children are able to make connections and relationships with the objects in front of them resulting in a stronger memory. So knowing this information before going into teaching is really helpful because it will help me become a stronger teacher if I know how my students learn. And um, Loris Malguza explains in the image um, of the child where teaching begins that teaching a child is just like a great forest. And this is like my favorite analogy that we've discussed throughout this course. Um, he goes on to explain that inside the forest, the child he goes on to explain that inside the forest is the child. Each forest is beautiful, fascinating, green, and full of hopes, and there are no paths. So because there are no paths, we as teachers um, have to create our own paths, which may not be easy because there's other people in the forest, like parents and their friends and extended family. And um, the most important thing about the forest is living together with the other people that are part of the child's life. So in this analogy, um, it is very useful for me as a person because we may not agree with other people in the student's life or like what we see as like um, we might our interest for the child may be different from their interests of the child so it's important to like um, promote the education of the child but also like the health and happiness of the child so with that like it's important to like have these relationships with not only the child but their family So based upon both of my previous answers, um, a clear value of mine as a teacher is communication. Um, just as I felt comfortable enough to communicate my academic and social issues with my teachers, I need to be the same for my students. Um, I want to be able to discuss with them how I can help them grow um, and what they need from me and perhaps anything else that they have going on in their lives. Um, communication not only allows me to be a better teacher, but it creates a welcoming environment for students. Um, when one develops the value of communication, there is also a value of respect, care, and intentionality that comes with it. Um, for good communication to occur, something must be stated or discussed, and for this to occur, students must be alike and listen and hear what others have to say. Um, this is not to say that words um, should be angry or hurtful, but they should be said with the intention of growing the relationship. And then students and teachers must both be able to be intentional about making some sort of change or reinforcing a current behavior. For example, like we've talked about how we can listen to our students' needs for the class. And if I approach a student and they gently let me know that they didn't appreciate my lesson, it's my job to investigate and intentionally find a way to equip that student in a different way. Um, this reinforces my value of ever-changing teaching and learning. Um, and while I understand that it can be easy to remain stagnant as a teacher by repeating the same lessons year after year, um, I'm determined to use my career for its purpose. I must be ever learning, ever evolving, and ever applying within my classroom. I'm excited to see how I will grow and change, but this class has given me the foundation that I need. Okay. So from my previous responses to our questions, an effective and authentic classroom starts with a strong classroom community. And for me, like, in second grade, if I wasn't like having a strong connection with my teacher or my classmates, I would not have like even maybe considered teaching just because of the influence she had on me and our strong classroom community. And so if our students don't feel safe or feel like they belong in a classroom, then they aren't going to enjoy coming to school or even learning at school. So the first and foremost important thing to do in, class, in a classroom is to build a community. So this is where students get to know one another so they feel like they belong and that their role in the community is important. Once students have this bond, then they will feel like they can express themselves and feel more comfortable to participate in class. So I also believe that in an effective classroom, it looks like one that incorporates play. And the younger children need more time immersed in imag imaginative play, but as a teacher, it is important to understand that um, all students need 
play. So like even at recess, like it's not right to take away recess time just because they're misbehaving because they need play time and they need to spend that time with their friends. And um, 